بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. We continue with the practical Tawhid series. We're going to talk about today divinity and fear, because worship, as we said before, according to the Indian school of thought, the scholars of India, they put four ingredients to worship. Divinity, what we learned about being the asal and the foundation. Of worship being du'a, du'a being ibadah, and du'a huwa ibadah. Worship is supplication. Waalaikumsalam to Abu And we and we explained how acts of worship, all of them are indeed a supplication. The Sheikh he says, Sheikh Ahmed Milibar, rahimahullah. And just remember, Sheikh Ben Baz did the muqaddim to this book, and he read it and he studied it, and he urged the people to teach this book in the masjid of Ahlu Sunnah. Meaning the Sheikh gave his stamp on the information in the book. لا شيء من عبادات إلا روحها بعث عليها هو دعاء. لولا ذلك لا تكون عبادة مثلا إن الصلاة أفضل عبادات. لكنها لا تكون عبادة إلا إذا كانت على ابتغاء رضوان الله ورجائه وذوابه وخوف أقابه. And he says that. Um, that we know that every act of worship in its core, in its soul, inside of it, it has a supplication. If it wasn't like that, then it wouldn't be an act of worship. Worship is not worship, not unless it has the ingredient of divinity. Not unless it has the ingredient of seeking the pleasure of the one you're worshiping, hope in that particular thing of its, of its reward, and fearing its punishment. So we have four ingredients, four we have divinity, we have pleasure, we have hope, and we have fear. So we have those things. So if those things are, are all together inside of the pot, then that thing will be an act of worship. It wouldn't matter if it was for Allah other than Allah. If it's for Allah, then we call it Tawheed. If this ingredients are put in or placed upon someone else other than Allah or given to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will still be worship, but it'll be shirk. The only reason I keep reading it is I want us to get these principles. These principles are very important to have because it shows you exactly what worship is and what worship is not. And it's very important to understand that. It's very important to have that and understood. He said, for example, for in Ruha Salah al Ba'ith Alayha huwa dua, qad wajadna nas in yusalun ithnata ashra raka kabula shurur. He said, وَإِبَادَةَ الشُّرْكِ أَحْدَثَهَا مُبْتَدِعُونَ أَهُمْ أَرْكَانُهَا نِدَاءَ الشَّيْخِ مُحِدِينَ الْفُ مُرَّةِ He said, for example, you have people that will pray 12 raka'at and they will call upon مُحِدِينَ الشَّيْخِ مُحِدِينَ الْفُ مُرَّةِ They will do that a thousand times, right? فَهَذِهِ صَلَاءَ رُوحَ بَعَثْ عَلَيْهَا دُعَى لِلشَّيْخِ مُحِدِينَ فَهِيَ عِبَادَةَ اللَّهُ Why? Because the same ingredients apply. If someone goes and they say, Jesus. And they make 12 raka'at in the name of Jesus. And they mention his name a thousand times. Jesus' name, Jesus name we pray, amen. The reason that will still be worship, and the reason that it's called worship, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kafirun, la'abudun ma ta'abudun. So he called, the, I will not worship what you worship. So he called what the kuffar were doing, worship. Why was it worship? Why? Because the, the ingredients were there. They believed the thing was divine. They believed Jesus is divine. They have fear for his punishment, hope in his reward, and they seek his pleasure. That's why it's worship. And that's why it's shirk, because that in, those ingredients belong only to Allah. But they give it to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in its improper place. This is why it's called shirk, because they're adding a partner to Allah. They're making someone equal to Allah with the right of worship. So he continues. Then <clears throat> Salat. Um... Something for example, someone may pray and have in it none of those ingredients present. Would that prayer be worship? No. An act of worship is only worship with those ingredients. An act of worship is only worship with those ingredients. Now, the shaykh continues. We're going to get into explaining fear because this is what we're talking about today. But I just want to give some background. Just continue to bring the same principles up so we can have them in our mind. Because I think the reason that we're missing out on understanding Tawheed, because we were given terminologies and not principles and not concepts. If we get con you give my, you give people concepts to eat, 
they can apply it everywhere. You give them principles, they can apply it everywhere. But if you give them a, terminologies that didn't exist, and everybody can come up with their own terminologies, then at that point, people lose everything is lost in translation. وَكَذَلِكَ لَا شَكْ أَنَّ صَدَقَ عَلَى فُقْرَاءِ تَعَامَ مِسَاكِينَ إِبَارَةَ لَكِنَّ بِشْرْتْ أَنْ يَبْتَغِي بِهَا وَجْهُ اللَّهُ وَهَذَا إِبْتِغَاءَ هُوَ الدُّعَاءَ He said, no doubt that giving sadaqah to the poor and feeding the, the miskeen and feeding the destitute is worship. But it has to have a condition to it. If I just go give somebody a hundred dollars just because I like him or I like her, is that now worship? It wouldn't be worship for her or for Allah. Because it doesn't have the ingredient of what? Seeking something. Seeking a reward. Seeking a pleasure. If I did it with those ingredients, then no doubt it will be dua. That ibtira, that seeking. That ibtira, seeking those, things, that those three things after divinity. Seeking things, the hope and reward based upon the fact that I don't want to be punished and I want to be rewarded. That ibtira right there, that's the dua. As Sheikh uh, Ahmed Milibari is saying, the ibtira is the dua. Whether I set it off my tongue, whether I use the act or an action of my heart to do the ibtigha or do the seeking. It wouldn't matter. It still be a dua. It still be a supplication. And because in that act of worship that I did, giving the sadaqah, those ingredients were in the core of it. They were inside of the intent. So when I did the act based on my intent, that made the act the act of worship. And I can do that for other than Allah. I would just be shit and I wouldn't be a Muslim anymore. But doing it for Allah, this is what makes someone a Muslim. This is the true difference between us and them. Even before the Salat, even though the Salat, no doubt, is a different, what's the difference between us and them is the Salat. But somebody can pray and not have those ingredients, his prayer wouldn't matter anyway. So the ingredients, the asal, the foundational principles have to be established so we can understand what's worship and what's not. And he says, أَمَّا سَلَكَ وَإِتْعَامْ عَلَى إِبْتِغَى وَرِضَى النَّاسِ فَلَيْسَ بِالْعِبَادَةِ He said, so... Person gives sadaqa and feed the poor, seeking the pleasure of the people. That wouldn't be the worship that we're talking about here. That would be, if anything, it would be minor shirk. It would be riyah, showing off at that level. But it wouldn't be the, the ibadah that something becomes an ilah, a deity. Because the problem, I think, is, is that I think that we learn Islam, we learn tawhid, but we never really learn what an ilah is, a deity is. We never get to that. We never, And I think by missing that, we start up saying everything is an ilah. Everything is an ilah. You, you, the desires, desires can be an ilah. According to the Indian scholars, and that's a whole other discussion about can your desires be an ilah, that, that ayat in the Quran. But there are many tafsir, I mean, of the Sahaba, where they said it, that means that your desires cause you to worship other than Allah. It's not the object of worship. And I'm going to stick with what the companion said, like Ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, and um, not go with the Ijtihad or the school of thought of some of the modern day scholars. But he says, <clears throat> he said, He said, because the reason that it wouldn't be the ibadah that makes something an ilah or takes you outside the fold of Islam, because it's it's not it doesn't have in its core, when you do an act for somebody other than Allah, like showing off, it doesn't have in its core the dua that is the core of ibadah. That is the core of ibadah. For example, um, showing off. Why isn't showing off major shirk? But it's called shirk, number one, because the Prophet Islam called it that in the legislation. So he used that term. But why isn't it major shirk removed you from the religion? Because it looks like it outwardly. It looks like shirk outwardly because you're giving an act to other than Allah. But inside its core, it doesn't possess the necessary ingredients inside of its core to take it to that level. Meaning you don't believe the individual is a ilah, a deity. Huh? You don't believe that he can harm and punish you in a way that Allah can harm and punish you. So in that fact, it's shirk because legislatively, the Prophet called it that. And it looks like it outwardly, but inside of its core, it doesn't have the necessary ingredients to reach the level of being major shirk. Even, he said, a person calls the avan. And the people come out, من بيوتهم وأسواق للأسواق ومكاتي مثلا إلى المساجد. The people come out from their offices and they come out from their... Uh, well, houses and things like that to the master. He said, Now, when a person hears the Avan and he's making the attempt to get up, leave his home, leave his office to go pray into the Masajid, he said, Every movement after he heard the Avan huh, has in it that those ingredients that make it worship. Why? He's walking to the master to worship Allah. He's walking to the master making dhikr. He's walking to the master, Allah's taking off the sins. 
and giving him good deeds, every right and the left. So all of that, that whole walk, that whole movement, will be considered to be a dua, according to Sheikh Ahmed Milibad. It's you using and you're calling upon your Lord, because as long as your intent is in place. He says, and he says that now let's take those same movements and someone who wants to go visit a grave to get blessings from the dead in the grave and then wants to get close to those in the grave. Every step that he takes toward that grave will be the same thing that he's doing, the person who's taking the steps towards the masjid. He wants the same reward. He has the same tirah. He has the same intent. He has the same seeking of what? Pleasure of the person in the grave, fearing that person's punishment, and wanting a reward. He's doing the same thing. And he believes the person is divine. And he believes the person is divine because the only way the person will hear you from the dead is you have to believe that he has some type of divine way of hearing. That his hearing and seeing and his knowledge of you is absolute and unlimited. That's a divine characteristic. And only Allah has those characteristics. And this is why he's doing the act of worship in the first place. Because he fears that particular person in the grave. And Allah SWT knows the hearts. And everything's go back to that intent of the heart. And how do we know that? Um, before we move on to fear, I'll give you a story of Yunus alayhi salam in the belly of the well. Yunus alayhi salam, when the well swallowed him, okay, because he got frustrated with his people, and he did he, he felt as though he gave them everything he could have gave them, and they didn't listen. He became frustrated, and he ran away from giving them dawah. So then, the well swallowed him by lost permission. Inside the belly of the well, he wanted out. Obviously, who wants to be in the belly of a well? But did Yunus, alayhi salam, did he ask, or did he say to Allah, Oh Allah, remove me from the belly of the well. No, he did an act of ibadah with the intent of being removed from the belly of the well. And we know it was a dua, the intent was the ibtigha. We know that, because how? He said, La ilaha ila anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al He said, oh, none has the right to worship except you. I, I am. <clears throat> none the Glory be to you, I have been one of the wrongdoers. Right? He said that. And what did Allah say? And we answered him. Answer what? He didn't ask for anything openly in his mouth, did he? What did he answer? The ibtigha, as Sheikh Ahmed Milibari is saying. The intent, the seeking. What was he seeking from Allah? Allah's pleasure. And hope that Allah was going to remove that punishment off of him. So he had the ingredients. Any believe Allah was divine. We know divinity was a part of the ingredients. Why? Because there's no way he would have didn't think Allah was divine. Because he called him from the belly of a well in the bottom of the ocean. He knew Allah was going to hear him. So he gave Allah the, the divine right, divine characteristics. Then he had what? Fear, hope, and love. He had the ingredients. And it was an act of worship. It's Allah said we answered him. Not only was it an act of worship, but it also was a dua. Because Allah said we answered it. So it had to be a supplication. It had to be a call. Those actions that he did. It was considered to be a call by Allah. And Allah said, we answered him. And Yunus as a prophet understood, it was a supplication. This is why the Prophet Islam said, Dua huwa ibad. Supplication is worship. That's what it means. And so the Yunus understood that too. That every act of worship, in fact, is a call to Allah, depending on whether it's from the tongue, the action, or the heart. So, um, he said, Dua huwa ibad. Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he said dua huwa ibad. Supplication is worship. Now we understand what that means. He said, Kadalika al mu'min yukhafu an yukarriba zina. Ibtigha wa ridwa wa ridwa wa ridwa wa ridwa min iqabihi. He said, a person, a believer, he doesn't come close to committing fornication. Why? Seeking Allah's pleasure and fearing that he will be punished for committing the act. So in that case, leaving off zina will be a what? A dua. What's the seeking there? What does he want? He doesn't want to be punished and he wants to be rewarded and, and have a lost pleasure. He's hoping in the lost reward. And that fact, leaving Zina will be a supplication. So, then <clears throat> he goes and he says, كَذَلِكَ إِطَاعَةِ أَحْبَارُ الرُّحْبَانِ مِنْ شَيْخُ الطُرْقِ إِبَارَةَ لَهُمْ وَالسَّبَبُ أَنْ تِلْكَ تَحْتَوِي عَلَى الدُّعَالِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ أَمَّا 
طاعة الملوك وحكام وزعماء سياسة فليس بالعبادة لأنها لا تحتوي على دعاء. Now, the Sheikh, he's going into something now that we'll touch on a little later, but I'll just touch on it a little bit. He's saying that obeying the priests and rabbis and the Sheikhs of Sufi and Shiaism is the worship of them, but it's not the same as obeying kings and queens. We miss we miss we mix that up sometimes. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentioned ahbarahum wa ruhbanhum min dunillah. And we understand that to mean that obeying just just the word obeying is there and they obey their um uh, uh, uh priests and rabbis and we leave it like that. But Sheikh Ahmed Milibar said it's not just like that. Ibn Taymiyyah also said the same thing, it's not just normal obedience. But Sheikh Ahmed Milibar he said no. It's not just obeying them. It was something behind it. They believed them to be um, He said they believed them to be uh, He said they, they believed that they believed that their priests and rabbis had positions. They were a lost replacements on the earth and they had unseen abilities to forgive them, to save them from the fire, to give them Jinnah, huh? to bless them. To give them miracles, to rub oil on their heads, to um, baptize them. They believe this. That that and and what it's called is called trans. It's called uh, transmission, meaning they can transmit divinity from each other. Meaning the Pope got divinity from Jesus, and Jesus got it from Allah. And now the Pope passes that divinity on to the priest, and the priest now can go around and do miracles. And this is what they believe about their priests and their rabbis, the Jews too. So at the end of the day, the sheikh is saying it's not the same as, as a president and some, somebody obeys him. Because what's missing in that obedience is the ingredients. The ingredients of divinity, fear, love, and hope. Those ingredients are missing from that obedience. And if it's missing from that obedience, that obedience won't be worshipped. Because in that case, then obeying your wife will be shirk, will be worshipped. Obeying your person at your job will be worshipped. All of it. Somebody comes up and say, smoke a cigarette. You take the cigarette and you smoke it. Now you're worshiping the one who offered you the cigarette because now you obeyed them in the haram. When does all of this stuff get in its proper place? And we, the reason we don't understand it because we don't have the principles to understand it. And now we're going around calling people not Muslim because we don't understand what's a Muslim and what's not. And that's the problem. That's a big problem. And he says, now you have the people who do believe their kings are um, they call it a divine hukuma like the Japanese believed about their emperor that he was sent here by the gods and his rule was godly and he had the right to rule and the right to uh, judge and the right to uh, judge people and rule over people because Allah gave him that right. The gods, the, the Japanese, they believe in the gods, gave him that right to rule. Now that's, and they believe that he was able to make them happy or sad. Now that king is a Tawhut. Because they, be, just like Pharaoh was a Tawhut, because the, the Egyptian people believe the same thing about Pharaoh. That's why Nimrud was a tall group, because they believe the same thing about Nimrud. But to place that meaning on other than the Pacific meaning given in the Quran, that's an issue that the shit is going to go into about exactly what's a tall group and what's not, according to the school of thought of the Indian scholars who they didn't agree that a tall group could be a political, um, like democracy and things like that. Yeah, there's a difference. There's, there's the difference between the Nejdi school of thought and the Indian school of thought about what's a Togut. But this is not the time. We don't have the time for it here. And that takes a whole lot of time to talk about. But before we end, before we end, we're just going to talk about the issue of fear. Right before we end. Because this is what we're talking about. I was getting up to that point. One of the ingredients of worship is fear. Now, what type of fear is I'm talking about I'm here? If I'm, I'm not talking about natural fear when you see a pit bull coming down the street to chase you and bite you and you run. The reason that fear is in worship because I know... That even though I'm scared of the pit bull, I know I can stop its harm. I can stop its harm. I can fight it. I can get a gun. I can get a knife. I can defend myself from that dog. I have the ability to. Even though I'm scared, I still can stop its harm. Um, a lion. I'm scared of a lion. I'm going to run. But if I get cornered, I know that I can get away from the lion. I can get away from the lion. Yeah, natural instinct, instinctive fear. I can get away from the lion. I get in the car. I get in the building. I can shoot it. Even though I'm scared, I know I can stop its harm. Now, 
let's say somebody comes to you and they say, they say to a particular person, you have to um, walk around your house seven times in my name. And this person then goes to China. And now you're scared of this person and you believe this person can see and hear you without a, a, a camera, without a cell phone, without any type of media that the law created, any type of means of how we see and hear and deal with them, he can go beyond those means. And then if you don't walk around your house seven times, he's going to now punish you in a way that you can't stop or you can't proceed with your five senses. You can't prevent the harm that this person able to bring upon you. This type of fear is only for Allah. And this is the fear that is worship. And this is the fear that is the ingredient of worship. And this fear, if it's placed to on Allah, then it's worship and tawheed. If this fear is now given to other than Allah on this level, then because you believe that this person has attributes of divine, of the divine attributes to know where you are, to able to bring about a harm to you that you can't prevent at all. This is godly or deity attributes that belong to a deity. And this is why, this is what a deity is. A deity is, you believe that they have certain attributes, certain characteristics that are unlimited, unblemished. Okay? A, a, a divine characteristics. This is what an elat is. This is what a divinity is. This is what a, a god is. So people then do fear, love, and hope based upon that divine, those divine characteristics they believe this thing possesses. Upon what? Not to be harmed by it, which is fear. To hope in his reward and to have pleasure. The pleasure part is that it doesn't punish you. You want its pleasure. And all of it starts with what? Believing that it's divine. So that is what fear is um, that makes something worship. And we'll get into more. And like I said, um, um, the Sheikh, he's going to go into, he's going to touch on um, exactly. Now he's going to go into the three types. Someone is saying that let it law means just obeying Allah or let it law means that Allah is just the Lord. He's going to go into those two things and refute those two positions that is known to the people of innovation. The Tabliq the, al-Dawah. The, uh, the the Muslim Brotherhood, the Khawarij, all of these different groups of bid'ah, the Sheikh is going to go in and now and pick apart their um, understandings of Lahir and Allah. And again, he's also going to touch on his understanding and the understanding of the scholars of his land, but the issue of Tawhut, um, we'll try to touch on that. And, and like I said, it doesn't mean that anybody is wrong or right. It's just that there is more understandings of what a Tawhut is, more than what we've been told. Uh, because most of what we've been told is really from Nejd, um their understanding of what a Tawhut is. But there are a lot of other scholars on the world, past and present, that did not understand Tawhut in the same exact way. And I think it, 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 it's from being just with those scholars and their hard work to present their case and to present their understanding of the issue, inshallah ta'ala. So I, I, I thank you for uh, coming with me this morning. And may Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.